Yeah. Uh, I have uh, a question about uh, the first argument of service uh, you talked about today, uh, the autonomy of uh, observational vocabulary. And uh, you say um, observational vocabulary is not a vocabulary uh, one could use, though one used no other. And uh, it seems to me um, that that doesn't follow from, from the argument uh, you give, because, um, I mean, you argue that uh, it's not enough that, that uh, claims are non-inferentially elicited, but they also have to be part of an inferential network. So it seems that uh, for that you could have a language um, in which every assertion in your repertoire can be applied uh, non-inferentially, but uh, these assertions are inferentially related to one another. So that would be a language in which every assertion can be uh, used non-inferentially, whereas uh, theoretical vocabulary would, be vocab would consist of assertions which cannot be uh, applied non-inferentially. So, um, yeah, there will be an example of uh, a language of observational uh, claims, uh, which one could have, though one had no theoretical claims, and that it, yeah, then it seems that the argument of Sellers uh, collapses. Okay, well, I agree with everything you said right up until the, the, the last bit. That is, the, the claim ought to be put more carefully, and sometimes I did, that uh, non-inferential uses of expressions do not form an autonomous stratum uh, of the language. You, you can't have a language all the uses of which are non-inferential observation reports. Uh, as you properly say, it does not follow from that that you can't have a language uh, all the concepts of which have non-inferential uses and in, and in that sense are, obser are uh, observable concepts. So uh, Sellers does distinguish uh, observational vocabulary as vocabulary that can be correctly applied as the result of exercising a non-inferential disposition to respond reliably to, say, red things. Uh, and distinguishes that from theoretical vocabulary, which can only properly be applied as the result of an inference. He, he argues along the way that the distinction between those concepts is not an ontological distinction. It's not that there's two kinds of things in the world, observable things and theoretical things. That's the thought from which instrumentalist uh, uh, lines of thought get going. He says it's only a methodological distinction so that when uh, the planet Pluto was first uh, considered, uh, all the claims you could make about it were, were the results of inferences. Uh, we didn't have instruments good enough to look for it. You had to infer its presence from perturbations in the orbits of other planets. But when we got better uh, measuring instruments, better telescopes, suddenly we could also make non-inferential reports of it, and now it got to be uh, an observational concept. It got non-inferential uses. Uh, of course, Pluto didn't change. This is just a methodological change in uh, the status of uh, the use of the concept. So Sellers does think that there could be an autonomous stratum of language uh, that consisted consisted entirely of concepts. This is Modulo, his principle, the grasp of a concept is mastery of the use of a word, that consisted exclusively of observable concepts, so concepts that had non-inferential uses. But what is not intelligible is that there should be an autonomous stratum of language, uh, the only uses of which are non-inferential. So there have to be non-observational uses, non-reporting uses of observational concepts. So observational uses, non-inferentially elicited applications of concepts, do not form an autonomous stratum of language. The concepts that have such uses, we could have a language that was devoid of theoretical concepts, such that every concept in it uh, had an observational use it's just sometimes we also use them as the conclusions uh, of inference. Now, that's all Sellers 
thinks he needs in the way of a non-autonomy claim. But you're quite right, it needs to be put in terms of the uses, not in terms of the observational concepts. Okay, since um, I'll, I'll be going into this very area, in, in my talk I'll, I'll just shell those remarks for the time being. Um, I, I just wanted to make a very brief remark about the, your, your view about Sellers and, and his uh, giving an alternative to the descriptivism, uh, the descriptivist paradigm of what modality is about, and that is, if you look at, for instance, Scott Soames' uh, pretty recent two-volume book on the history of analytic philosophy, he, he sort of arranges the whole book uh, around the claim that um, analytic philosophy as a collective enterprise finally, with Kripke, um, manages to understand what necessity is and what a priori truth and what conceptual truth is. And I, I guess you then say, as a fellow, and, and I, I mean, he doesn't, as far as I remember, Soames never mentions Sellers anywhere in, in, that, in those two volumes, uh, which is pretty bad, I guess. Um, so I guess you'd say just that oh, Soames misses a great deal of the point. Yeah, I think so. I, I mean, for most of the history of analytic philosophy, uh, modal concepts were considered the most puzzling, the most suspect concepts. Uh, there wasn't any reason for naturalists to be suspicious about them. If you thought natural science was uh, our best understanding of the world, well, it's modally articulated. And you have it. But the empiricist tradition uh, had a big problem with this, so starting with Hume, and Quine, of course, is a, um, epitomizes a later version of that. As I mentioned in passing, this was the issue that split apart uh, uh, the Vienna Circle. Uh, you had people who you know, they realized that there was this collision between naturalism and empiricism. They wanted to be both naturalists and empiricists. And you had people like Neurath who said, well, so much the worse for empiricism. If it can't understand modality, we naturalists have got to reject empiricism. And you had people like Schlick who said, so much the worse for modality and so naturalism. Uh, if uh, it collides with our empiricism, then we've got to get rid uh, of these notions. And you have poor Carnap trying, trying to sort of hold them together, uh, who, who feels the pull of both of these, uh, of both of these things. If you had uh, transported the members of the Vienna Circle, or you know Russell and Moore or Ayer, uh, in a time machine to today. Uh, and they've looked in the philosophical journals and seen that whenever some concept is uh, considered philosophically problematic, so when we want a reconstruction of semantic vocabulary, uh, intentional vocabulary, even normative vocabulary, that the very first move that analytic philosophers make is to appeal to counterfactual dependencies, to appeal to modal vocabulary uh, in order to, to make uh, clear and intelligible to reconstruct this other vocabulary, they would think that something wonderful must have happened, that these most mysterious of all concepts for them, the modal concepts, apparently we had understood something wonderful uh, about them that had transformed them into these unproblematic concepts. And if we ask what that was, it seems to me it cannot be that we got uh, sound and complete uh, semantics for modal logics, uh, that, that doesn't uh, sufficiently explicate these concepts. And if we look at possible world semantics, well, you know, the notion of possible world, as Klein insists, it's a modal concept. That, that is not giving the sort of account of modality that was wanted by the empiricist tradition. We got a very intricately articulated inferential grip on the modal vocabulary, and I'm sure you know, Carnap in particular would have uh, admired that, but it, that's not a responsive answer to the, to the worries that they had about modality. So if we ask, well, why is it 
uh, not just a matter of fashion or of our getting tired of playing that game or something. Why are we entitled to our current level of comfort with alethic modal concepts? I think the answer is what justifies that, what would justify that, is this Kant Sellers thesis. When we realize that, we can't be in the Humean Quinean predicament that uh, being able to deploy ordinary, unproblematic, descriptive empirical concepts already involves uh, being able to, to do what counterfactual conditionals and alethic modality makes explicit. We see that there's no reason for us to, 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 be, to have that level of discomfort about them. But that argument is not abroad in the land. Scott Soames has not heard about that uh, uh, argument. And so I think that, that there is a lot of work to be done in thinking about modality now. I, I mean, I think our having the level of comfort in using alethic modalities to understand other, I would say, non-descriptive uses of language is uh, altogether a good thing and that we're making progress uh, doing that. I'm very interested in those programs in semantics, for instance, and thinking about intentional vocabulary. Uh, but I think we need more attention to the foundations uh, of that, more, more thought about just what we have learned or need to learn about the, the modal vocabulary. And I think doing that is going to require uh, extending this line of thought that Sellers brought, well, not all the way to the end, just sort of showed us the promised land. Uh, just to follow up, I mean, because uh, it seems to me that Cancela's argument shows why modal concepts are indispensable, why we have to use them, we, we have no choice, but the more puzzling question is what makes, uh, what make uh, modal claims correct and incorrect, I mean, because in the case of descriptive language, you you say that the claim is correct or incorrect because they, they have right or wrong true conditions. But in the case of modal claims, which, which, which still seems to be puzzling, what, what uh, make our modal claims correct or incorrect? You, you cannot give true, con true conditions. You have to give some assertability condition, but the question is how to specify them. Well, I absolutely agree with you. That, that there are serious problems left over, and this, this is why I actually think we're in early days in our philosophical understanding of uh, uh, the modal claims. Uh, one question that's raised immediately, well, if the expressive function distinctive of modal vocabulary is not assimilated to description, uh, does it follow from that that looking for truth conditions is the wrong thing to look for? Uh, does the notion of a truth conditional semantics inevitably carry with it a, a commitment to semantic descriptivism, or is there a way to extend the truth conditional uh, paradigm beyond the merely descriptive? Uh, here's what seems to me a genuinely deep issue that I don't know uh, what to say about, that um, uh, sort of underlies that, as it were, technical question in, uh, in semantics. So one of Kant's great insights was that there are essential features of the whole framework of empirical description, essential features of that that can be put in the form of declarative sentences, but whose job is not to describe how things empirically are. And law-like statements were principal among them. So the statement that, in his terminology, every effect has a cause, uh, that, uh, that the properties we can empirically describe things as having stand in law-like relations to each other, that's something we can say assertorically. It is not, on Kant's understanding or on Seller's uh, understanding, an empirical feature of the world. It's one of those framework features, one of those features of the framework of description uh, that, that has to be there for anything in that framework to have the function of describing, uh, but which is not performing that function. Well, all right, that claim, that 
uh, empirical properties stand in law-like relations, that uh, empirical descriptive properties uh, are in, stand in relation support counterfactually robust reasoning. Those are not empirical descriptive properties of the world. Well, anyway, not at the same level as you know, the cat is on the mat uh, is, and maybe just not descriptive at all. But in between, we've got the actual laws of nature that uh, pure copper necessarily melts between 1,083 and 1,084 degrees C. Now, that is an empirical claim. We have to go out and see how the world actually is in order to discover that that's the law-like connection that articulates the concept of copper and not some other one. That's what instantiates the framework feature. Now, the fact that that's a bit of empirical knowledge, does that mean there must be some aspect of reality that it describes? Does it mean that uh, we've got to be able to give truth conditions for that law-like statement in something like the same form that we can give them for the ground-level empirical descriptions that uh, uh, make up, that happen within the framework that's being articulated by these statements. Now, I think we don't have a good story about the status of uh, those empirical laws. They're, they're things that epistemologically uh, we have to find out about uh, empirically. Uh, they are on the con seller's line part of the semantics of the concepts uh, they essentially involve this modal vocabulary whose job it is to articulate the framework rather than uh, the ground level things. I don't think we have uh, an adequate story about the status of things like that. If Soames were right and you know, we could look back and say, well, we analytic philosophers, we finally brought you know, modality within the, the scope of our understanding. There ought to be answers to those questions. But that's not something that the possible world's framework has been addressed to, because it's a different kind of modality that they have been worried about. So, I mean, I absolutely agree with the, uh, with the point that you're making, that you know, it's early days in our understanding of these things. This is part of what I meant by saying Sellers got only as far as he did with this line of thought. Uh, I conjecture that the reason he didn't write about modality after about 1959 was that he never figured out what to say about these questions. Uh, and if there's nothing to be said on his line, well, maybe that means it's broken back. But we ought to give it a better run for its money than it's had so far. Maybe I just want to uh, push a bit for, um, on this. Uh, maybe you're right, actually you're really answer on it, but <clears throat> I do think that when you say that uh, copper does melt at, let's say, 1,084 degrees, well, you do describe something. That is at least what scientists would say. And they say that if there were 1,083 uh, degrees, that it would not melt. It seems to me that... Uh, semantic descriptivism, uh, descriptivism about modalities would actually uh, account for, explains what scientists would say when they say that a state of affair would not obtain. So the argument would be, well, maybe semantic descriptivists about modalities do have something to, uh, to uh, they do support some sort of scientific reasoning when we reason about laws of nature. Um, so and what is puzzling your account of Seller is that, well, of course, Seller doesn't want to say this. Seller has this quite general idea about necessity and possibility, which, is, of course, cannot be uh, described in descriptive sense. Uh, the question is what he has in mind is, is not this sort of semantic descriptivism that we are criticizing. Well, I suppose what I already said about that is that I don't know what to say uh, uh, about that. But... You know, when we say uh, copper necessarily melts at 1,084 degrees C, uh, the, the question is how we should think about the contribution that necessarily makes to that. 
the empiricist, Mr. C, he says, well, look, I understand that you're asserting this regularity, uh, that there's a constant conjunction between heating things to that temperature and uh, the copper melting. But what Mr. C doesn't see is that the necessarily is uh, adding anything uh, to that statement or anything in- intelligible. He can't understand what it's adding to it. Sellers says... Uh, that necessarily is adding to it the invocation of the location in the space of implications that makes terms like copper and melting point into descriptions and not just labels. So we say it at least has that uh, distinctive expressive role. Now Sellers thinks that because it has that expressive role, it cannot also have a descriptive role. It cannot be describing some kind of super fact, a different kind of fact from the fact that this coin melts at uh, a thousand, melted at 1,084 degrees uh, when I melted it. Uh, well, we have investigated other cases where the descriptivist, non-descriptivist distinction uh, has been in play. Uh, contemporary metaethical uh, expressivism uh, looks at the question of whether you know, when I say this is what you ought to do uh, in a particular case I'm describing a particular kind of fact or as classical expressivism said performing a very different kind of speech act expressing a pro uh, attitude towards it uh, and what's distinctive of contemporary uh, metaethical expressivism is a much higher level of sophistication about this issue of whether that's incompatible with it being descriptive uh, as well. And so people like Blackburn and Gibbard want to say, well, look, there is a descriptive component to it, but uh, you can't understand what you're doing when you use normative vocabulary if, if all you uh, have in view is the descriptive component. You've also got to appreciate that there's this other expressive component to it. Now, the challenge for them, of course, is saying how those things get together uh, and that you know, they've made some progress with. But again, I think it's pretty early days in thinking about so, so what is the descriptive component and how can it combine with other things? The, the point I guess I want to make is it seems to me we've actually walked farther down that road for normative vocabulary in thinking about how we might have a distinctive constellation of description-like elements in the expressive role distinctive of that vocabulary and ones that are not description-like. We've we've walked farther down the road in articulating uh, uh, what kinds of combinations there could be for normative vocabulary than we have for uh, the modal vocabulary where, you know, Soames would say, well, of course, the normative vocabulary is still a mystery to us, but the, the modal vocabulary, we're, we're all over. We're on top of that. Uh, so you know, I take that just to be a, that situation just to be a confirmation that we haven't thought hard, about, uh, hard enough about this on the modal side. And in some sense, as, a philosopher, as first and foremost a philosopher of language, what I care about most is what we can learn about concepts like description and its relation to inference, uh, content, and so on, from looking at these kinds of vocabulary, normative, modal uh, vocabulary, that is alethic modal and deontic modal, that are of independent philosophical interest, uh, and where we can see that the simplistic way of dividing things up is its job in the language, the job of this word to describe things or not, well, our concept of description just doesn't cut fine enough, as I indicated earlier. Does that go hand in hand with uh, truth evaluability, uh, with there being some fact of the matter, with uh, an epistemology that involves an empirical component? We just haven't sorted these things out. Okay, we did the last question. Well, I, uh, I have a comment and a question unrelated to the comment. It seems to me that that's interesting parallel between this argument of, of, of source and you that uh, description doesn't uh, make an autonomous uh, discursive practice and the argument uh, from Wittgenstein's philosophical investigation 
that uh, naming is not an autonomous language game. By the way, the argument which I think is much more important uh, for uh, Wittgenstein's achievement of his later later philosophy than, than is usually recognized. And uh, but the, now the question: what 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 I wonder is how what Sir says uh, in the papers uh, you discussed uh, connects with his dialectics of the um, scientific image and, and manifest image because, uh, well, uh, why, why are we not able to assimilate the manifest image to the scientific image? Uh, well, because it's, it's, it's normative, it, it's fraught with thought, but uh, uh, what it, it seems that what serves us in these papers is that even the scientific image is, in a sense, fraught with thought. Do you think it, it, it's possible to uh, articulate the difference between the, between the ways in which the two images are fraught with the old? Okay. Uh, well, on the comment, uh, Sellers has very much in mind in his critique of semantic descriptivism the, the lesson that Wittgenstein early and late uh, taught, and that is originally a Phrygian uh, lesson, uh, of, of the I inadequacy of semantic nominalism. So, so semantic nominalism says to be a meaningful bit of language is to be the name of something. And that, that seems to make sense for Fido the name and Fido the dog, or maybe it should be Obama the, do the name and Obama the dog. Uh, but you know, when we think about redness, uh, it, it's not clear that the right way to think about is red is to look for the part of the world that is named by or stands in that uh, relation to. I think Frege says you, you've got to, to think also of what you're doing when you say that things are thus and so and naming and understand the semantic uh, significant the semantic content of the predicates as sort of what gets you between uh, the, the naming and uh, the saying. Naming and saying, of course, is the title of one of Seller's central essays where he you know, lays out that point. Uh, and Sellers thinks that even after uh, analytic philosophy by and large gave up its love affair with semantic nominalism, not, not completely, by the way. Jerry Fodor is still you know, a, a semantic nominalist, but uh, but by and large gave up, you know, learned that lesson and gave up that love affair. That it, in some sense a corresponding mistake lived on in, in the form of descriptive uh, of descriptivism. Uh, and you know, it's an interesting question exactly how tight the analogy is uh, uh, between them. But it's certainly suggestive, as uh, you suggest. Now. Uh, on the manifest in the scientific image, I, I myself think Sellers was way too dualistic uh, uh, about these uh, images, and for some of the reasons that you point to, but by his own lights, normativity is involved in uh, the scientific image, and the, the language of science is also not an autonomous uh, stratum of discourse. It, it's essentially and not just accidentally embedded in discourse in which we attribute commitments to each other and hold each other responsible and so on. And, and yet the, the rhetoric about these images uh, is as if the scientific image were uh, semantically autonomous. Now, it, it, my suspicion is that he's running together epistemological issues and semantic issues in some ultimately confused way here. That, that the, the sense in which uh, those are alternatives is sort of epistemic or epistemological, and that if he had followed his usual practice of, of looking at the semantics uh, before worrying about the epistemology, that, that we wouldn't have gotten that uh, a dualistic uh, picture, and, and when I call it dualistic, I'm thinking of that within uh, the scope of the definition that uh, distinctions are fine. Uh, distinctions become dualisms when they're drawn in terms that makes the relation between the distinguished items ultimately unintelligible. <laughs>
uh, and the, the two dualisms that are most worrisome in sellers is the dualism of manifest and scientific image and the dualism of fact and norm. That is, he's uh, at least in danger of having seen the way in which Kant's appreciation of the fundamentally normative character of semantics and intentionality uh, dissolves the Cartesian um, dualism of mind and body uh, by replacing the dualism of the mental and the physical with one of the factual and the normative. And this, that's a worry that Sellers agonized about th throughout his career and claimed to, to have avoided making the relation between those unintelligible and so having uh, reinstituted a dualism there. But it's a nice question what his story about the relations between them is. Um. Well, I think we have to thank our speaker and Paul.